by the end, this guy is a guy that knows his Old Testament, which is all he knows, inside and out. And he, he begins to recognize and he begins to have this conversation with this guy named Jesus that he begins to recognize and he notices Jesus is from God. He has not made the connection that Jesus is God. And, but here's why I relate to Nicodemus. I can relate to Nicodemus a little bit. And um, that's because as a guy that really kind of grew up in the church, I knew a lot about God, but I didn't really know God. And I think a lot of people go through that, right? A lot of people go through that. But here's the other place that I really enjoy this um, conversation is because even after I gave my life to Christ, even after I gave my life to Christ, there are people, man, that once they give their life to Christ, they are good to go. Like, their relationship with Jesus never seems to slow down. That is not me. I am a constant struggler. I, I'm a constant struggler. I look around the church, and I'm a pastor on staff. And if you want to really feel guilty about your relationship with God, become a pastor. That will really screw you up. And, and, and because here you come into this relationship with God, and now not only do you know what you should do, you teach others what to do, Right? And then all of a sudden, it's like, but man, my, my, my first nature just seems to kick in a lot. And so, for a lot of people, a lot of people really love John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him shall not, um, shall not perish but have everlasting life. Like, like, we grew up learning that scripture, right? All right. But John 3, 17 is my favorite. It's probably my favorite passage in the Bible. And, and so tonight we're going to finish up um, John 3, 17. But you've got to keep the context of John chapter 3 going. Well, you've got to keep the context of John 1, 2, and 3 going. John is telling everybody. This is a book of proclamation. Guys, I discovered Jesus, and he is God. Okay, so, so he, John is laying this out, and he's saying, I discovered Jesus, the Christ, the one we've all been waiting for, the one that, that we've been looking for for 2,000 years. I discovered him in the person of, of Jesus. I discovered Christ. Okay, and so then he begins to unveil this story of saying, not only did I discover him, but Nicodemus, the Pharisee, he discovered him. And as we get into chapter 4, he begins to lay out these proofs of who Jesus is. But the other portion that I want you to really pick up on is this, that this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus is a conversation not because Nicodemus is just happening to go to talk to Jesus and Jesus is saying, I'm God, but what John is trying to point out is this whole point that when you seek God, you find him because he really, really wants to show himself to you. And so that's what we're going to start with tonight, okay? That when you seek God, that God wants you to know him. He's not impersonal. He's not impersonal. So when you seek God, God wants you to find him. So I'm going to just pray for us tonight. I know we've already prayed about five times. We're going to do it again. Father God, we're just going to come to you right now tonight, Father. Because we are believing that when we seek you, the Lord, just like John wrote in his letter, God, that he was, he was trying to convey a message that when we seek you, we find you. And just like Nicodemus, who's a guy that so many people thought would never discover you, he recognized that you were from God. But God, that whole idea that takes it to the next step of not just recognizing that Jesus may have been from God, but Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the world. And so God, tonight, that as we finish up John chapter 3, that you would um, speak to us in our hearts, that you would speak to us in our spirits, God. Lord, maybe even that you would speak to us in our mind. But more than anything, God, I want my spirit to connect with your spirit tonight. And just the revelation of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You see, so here's why this is so important. Because what you believe about God affects how you converse with him. Have you ever noticed that? What you believe about God really affects not just 
what you think about him, but it affects how you approach him. Because when I'm thinking that God's mad at me, I stay away from him. Do you guys ever have days when you think that God's mad at you? Come on, if you do, raise your hand. Okay, because it's important. The reason I ask you to raise your hand isn't just so that I know. Because see, when you raise your hand, you look around and you go, oh, there's other people that are as screwed up as I am. That's awesome. I can come to church with a bunch of whacked out people. And so, so like, the way that you view God affects the way that you approach God. And if you think that God is mean, then I'm guessing that you probably don't approach him very often. If you think that God is uncaring, then you probably come to a place in your life where you begin to really realize that, you know, if God is mean and uncaring, then why would I even seek after a God like that? If you think that God's angry, then anytime you get a flat, you think it's because he's out to get you. You guys have those moments? I was eating at a Chinese restaurant the other day. This is funny. This has nothing to do with my message at all. <laughs> but it's a good story. I'm eating at a Chinese restaurant the other day, and you know what my fortune cookie said? Become a better tipper. <laughs> and you know what I'm thinking? God, what's that about? I'm a good tipper. I tip 20%. And, but there's this whole thing. It's like, it's like the, the way that we think about God becomes the way that we approach God. And if you think that God's angry, then probably every time you get a ticket, you relate that back to something that you weren't supposed to do. And so you kind of go, it kind of becomes this view of that maybe God's out to get us. If you think that God doesn't care, then what happens is the way that you view life is that God's really uninvolved. And then maybe you think that he's uninvolved in your marriage. Maybe you think that he's uninvolved in your relationship with your parents. Maybe you just think he's uninvolved with you, that you pray all the time, but he doesn't hear you, that he makes it really difficult for you to get to know him. Have you ever felt that? That whole idea. I mean, here we are, we're getting ready to go into Christmas, and yet Christmas is a time about celebrating the Christ. And yet for so many people, they feel like God puts up these barriers that keeps us from him. And the book of John is just absolutely opposite of that. The book of John is this whole idea that, guess what? Not only does God drop the barriers, but in dropping the barrier, he broke through the barrier by bringing his own son. And so there comes a point and there comes a time for me that not only do I want to see God and I want to know him personally, but there are just days where I don't just want to know God, but I want to be rescued. Have you ever felt that? I don't want to just know God. I want to be rescued by God. We were sitting around talking the other day, and we are talking about being rescued. And, and as we talked about being rescued, somebody said, oh, there is the best clip of a rescue in The Matrix Reloaded. I want you to check this out.
use some help. What is that? I love that. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes, sometimes I think that as we go through life, I think that as, as we, um, sometimes we go through life, it's like, man, are there good days? Man, there are great days. I love life. I'm a guy who loves life. I wake up happy. I wake up talking, which for introverts just kills my wife. But I just, I love life. But some days it just seems like when you examine the world and when you look at all that's going on in the world, some days you just feel like, man, it just seems like we're getting beat, right? It just seems like we're getting beat. And what John is saying is we're not, we're not getting beat. As a matter of fact, God came to redeem what the enemy has stolen from your life. And this is what John 3 is about. If you have your Bibles, please open up. Please follow along with me. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But, but remember, this isn't a scripture verse to memorize. This is a conversation that one man is having with another man, that Jesus is having with Nicodemus. He's saying, Nicodemus, don't you know that it was God who loved the world? It was God that gave his only son. And whoever believes in him should not perish but we'll have eternal life. And he says, so Nicodemus, don't you understand that God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world? That's not what was going on. But in order that the world might be saved through him. You see, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light for one reason, because they were evil. I got to tell you, the reason that I sin, many times, the reason that I sin is for one reason, because I know what's right and I choose to do what's wrong. All right, straight up. Amen? Amen. That, that, that it's not because I can't control myself. The reason that you sin isn't because you can't control yourself. I'm, I'm saying that most of the time, I'm saying like 99.9% .9 of the time, like when I choose to do what's wrong, it was not an accident. I saw the train wreck coming, and I stepped on the gas. Right? That you see it coming, and you're like, I know I shouldn't do this. I know I shouldn't do this. I'm doing it anyway. Sometimes it's from doing things you shouldn't do. Sometimes it's from controlling your anger. Sometimes it's from controlling what's coming out of your mouth. Sometimes it's your thoughts. But, but the reason that I choose to sin isn't because I don't know what's right. It's because at the bottom, at the core, there is still an evil side that the enemy has his grip, grip on and that I jump to because that's human nature. All right? And maybe you're sitting out there and you're going, wait a second, you're Pastor Paul. If this is blowing you away, you've got bigger issues than what I just told you. Because the realization is, man, we're all sinners. We all blow it. We all screw this one up. And the reason that Jesus came was because you and I can't get it right. It's not that one of these days we could have got it right, and Jesus and God said, let's cut this thing short. I'm getting tired. He went, there's not a chance you and I are never going to get to doing what's right because we don't have the ability, because our deeds are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen 
that his works have been carried out by God, carried out in God. So he's just saying this, that, that there is a way to come clean. There is a way for God to take control of your life. There is a way to get past your past. And there's only one way, and we're going to talk about it at the very last point, but there's only one way, and that is to expose what's going on in your life. You see, the instrument in developing an accurate view of God, that what, what, what we're trying to get to tonight is that there is this accurate view of God. There is this view of God that we're supposed to comprehend. And I think he says it so clearly that I didn't want to change the point. The first thing that I want you to write down is just simply this. You have to get this. If you do not ever get this in your Christian life, if you never get this point, you will always struggle in your relationship with God. God did not come to condemn the world. He did not come to condemn the world. You see, why this is so important is because, man, in our society, we heap condemnation on ourselves, don't we? Like, how many of you guys have ever done, you got to raise your hand. How many of you have ever done something you really, really, really regret? Okay, okay, now we're still playing the game, okay? Everybody's hand went up, just so, for, so, for, for those of you that were looking around. All right, and those that didn't were lying. All right? So, like, if you've ever, ever, ever done something that you regret doing, how many of you still beat yourself up for that? Everybody, if you've blown it, and you've done something that you regret doing then you beat yourself up for it because we love condemnation. And not only do we love to heap it on ourselves, even though we say we don't, it feels even better to heap it on other people. <laughs> right? It feels so much better to go, oh, no, 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 no. You are a bigger screw-up than me. <laughs> I mean, I thought that I was really a big screw-up. I thought that I was somebody who didn't get this whole thing, but no, no. As a matter of fact, there is somebody that's a bigger script than me, and it's you. Right? That's human nature. But there's this point, and you got to get it. God did not send his son to condemn the world. You see, and as, we, as next week, as we go into John chapter 4, we're going to read about this woman that is just known as the Samaritan woman. And it's this really simple story, and we're going to really unpack it next week. But really, it boils down to this. There's this woman, and she has this issue with guys. Ladies, have you ever known another lady that has issues with guys? <laughs> Guy issues? Yeah. So, you know, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> so anyway, so she has this issue with guys, and Jesus comes up to, spend, to get a drink of water, and she's at this well, and he's at this well, and man, he's a Jew, and she's a Samaritan, and as a matter of fact, Jews hate Samaritans, and Samaritans hate Jews. And, and, and there's this issue that not only do they not talk, but they don't help each other. And Jesus asks her for some water. And then in that moment, she can't believe it, and they begin to talk. And, she, and he says, boy, I bet you would like some living water. I don't know about you, but that whole idea of living water sounds good. I mean, that water that doesn't, where you're not always dragging through life. And, and that sounds good. And she says she wants some. And so they start talking. And he says, you know what you should do? You should go get your husband. This is so interesting. So interesting. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, oh, yeah, no, no, I, I realize that. Well, how would you know that? We don't even know each other. Let's see. You've had five husbands. And she says, how would you know? Have you ever had that moment with God? We're like, you know you've just got into a conversation that is going to take you someplace that you're not sure that you're ready to go. But you know it's God. And, and he says, you've had five husbands. And she says, well, how, how would you know that? He goes, oh, that ain't a big deal. I know, as a matter of fact, that not only have you had five husbands, but you're sleeping with this guy. You're living with this guy. He's not even your husband. Like, you've jumped out of five marriages and now you're sleeping with a guy that's not your husband. Now, now, here's how it comes across from Satan's standpoint. You are a whorish woman. 
you have a terrible reputation. And, and the enemy just heaps condemnation, condemnation about this woman's past on her. But God comes along. Jesus, the Christ, comes along and says, yeah, you've had five husbands. And the person you're living with is not your husband. And, and guess what? She doesn't hear his condemnation. Why? Because just like Romans says, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, now, now doesn't mean that God doesn't speak truth to us. As a matter of fact, he speaks reality, right? Like any time that you're walking through your life and you know you're not supposed to be where you're supposed to be, does God ever let you off the hook on that? No. That's for the record. Just for the record, if you were wondering what the right answer to that question was, the answer is no. He doesn't. He never says, oh, go ahead, it's not a big deal. He always says, this is a big deal. Don't do it. But he's not saying, you are a whorish woman, or you are a terrible man, that like you've ruined your life. He's saying, come back to me. You see, Jesus wasn't heaping condemnation on this woman. God didn't send his son to condemn this woman. If you flip over one more chapter and you, you go to chapter 5, there's this guy, and, and, and the story's called the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. And Bethesda was this pool that moved around and stirred, and it was kind of this warm pool, and they believed that people who could get into the pool would be healed. But you know what else they believed? They believed that people that had sicknesses had sicknesses because they had sin. So you see, there wasn't this mass group of people going out to say, hey, let's get these people into the water. This guy had been there for 18 years. And the reason that he had been there for 18 years is because people believed he was a man that was full of sin, that he had these sicknesses, that he had his disease, his, his, his plight in life, because he was a sinner. And why would anybody help out sinners? As a matter of fact, sinners should get everything they deserve. That's what these people believed. Nobody helped this man. And so Jesus come along and said, be healed, take up your mat and walk. And all of a sudden he was healed. As a matter of fact, just like this man and just like this woman, I believe that Jesus, as he spoke to that woman, you know what he was really speaking? He was saying, you know what, I, I know what you really want. It's not this whole guy thing that you really are into. What you really want is love. I, I know what you really want. It, it's, it's not that you need this whole man issue, but there's a certain security in looking for love. Looking for someone who accepts you. You see, here, here's what's really cool about Jesus. Not only does he not condemn you, and if you've, if you've been around God for any length of time, you know that. But there is this thing inside that you that keeps you from grabbing on to that. Because not only, did he, not, not only did he convey that he wasn't condemning her, he was actually communicating to both these people, I know you better than you know yourself. Do you know why? I made you. Isn't this interesting? That God knows us that Christ knows us better than we know ourselves. And how do you discover that? From running from him, right? And then when you're running from him, you're running from him, and you're trying to ignore him, and you're trying to, to pretend like, like life without him would be better than life with him, right? You guys have done that one, right? And you're trying to pretend like life without him would be better than life with him, and as he draws you back, what's he drawing you back to? relationship with him and said hey no 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 I know I know what I know what's better for you not not just because I know you but because I created you you see here's what's really cool is not only did God come into the world not to condemn the world now how great would that be that Jesus shows up and he says hey I'm not here to condemn you now, if, if that was the promise, if that was it, if, if Jesus just walked around saying, I'm not here to condemn you, how much more would you sin? You're not here to condemn me? No. <laughs> right on. Party on, dude. See you, man. 
That wasn't just the promise. I'm not here to condemn you. But Jesus didn't just come not to condemn. Jesus came to save. Okay, so if Jesus came not to condemn but to save, then there has to be this piece of the puzzle, and we're going to talk about it in just a second. And the piece of the puzzle is if Jesus came to sin to save, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> delete that, John, from the CD. He's going, not a chance. We'll sell more. If Jesus came to save, then what did he come to save? People who were condemned. So Jesus didn't come to condemn, he came to save. Well, the only way that he can come to save people is that they must be condemned. John 3, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world, the world might be saved through him. You know what? You and I have the same problem as the people over in the Middle East have. Same problem. You say, no, we're nothing like them. We are exactly like them. We have sin issues. We have heart issues. We're the same as the people in Russia. We're the same as the people in Asia. We're the same as the people in Europe. That our issue is we have sin issue. We have sin issues. Jesus came to save the world. That's why we're talking about this tonight. Because Jesus is the great rescuer. That, that's what he is. He's not a rescuer. He is the great rescuer. You see, and here's this issue, is we want him to rescue us on our terms. You ever heard that story about the guy that was in a flood, and the flood had reached 14 feet, and his rooftop was 17 feet, and all of a sudden, a boat comes out of nowhere, and he had been praying that God would send a rescuer, and so he looks over at these guys, and these guys say, hey, come on, jump in the boat, we'll save you. And he turns and he says, no, 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 God's going to save me. No, 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 we'll save you, get in the boat. No, God, God's going to save me, I'm good. Water goes to 15 feet. A little while later, boat leaves, helicopter comes along. They throw down a rope, he says, Grab hold of the rope. We'll save you. He says, no, hey, I'm good. God's going to save me. I'm okay. God's going to save me. Long story short, flood takes over. Guy's in heaven. He looks up at Peter. He says, what's this? He said, God's supposed to save me. He says, that's what the boat and the helicopter were for, stupid. Right? I mean, we want God to save us, but we only want God to save us on our terms. We only want God to reach us on our terms. Jesus came to save the world. He is the Savior. He's the Prince of Peace. As a matter of fact, Savior becomes one of his names in the Bible. You see, here's what I, I, I see Jesus as. You see, what we want is we want Jesus to be a way. Maybe there's a whole bunch of different ways that I can go. And there's a lot of people that really struggle with Jesus being the way. You see, when you're thinking about saviors, Jesus is the rescue boat. When you're thinking about saviors, Jesus is the lifeguard. He is the one that saves. Way too many people see God as this angry God and that, sure, he came to save me, but he screwed the whole thing up anyway. And they see him as not the person who comes in the boat to save, but the person who shot the hole in the bow, and now the ship is going down, and now he shows up. You see, the way the Bible describes it, John chapter 17, or John chapter 3, verse 17, that there's a condemnation on the world, and the condemnation is sin. And that when God looked down and saw the plight of humanity... Because of his great love for us, because of his great love for us, he said, we got to save them. we got to save them. The water's rising. we got to do something about it. 
John also believes this so much that as he writes, his, he writes five books in the Bible. He writes in 1 John 4, 9. This is how that God showed his love for us. His love amongst us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. You see, here's the tension of this world. I was going to say Christianity, but it really isn't the tension of Christianity. It's the tension of this world. Jesus came to save us, but we all still live broken lives. Jesus conquered sin and death. But you and I are still sinners, and we will die. And so the tension we have to come to terms with is that the kingdom of God is now. See, I believe that when we pray for each other, I believe that God hears it and responds. It's not just a gimmick that says, man, your life has fallen apart, and God wants to bring healing to it. It's not just a gimmick that says, man, you've got sickness, You've got some sort of sickness that God has the ability to he bring healing. The tension is, is that we still live in a fallen world, and that's why we need God. God came. We need him. You see, here's the real tension. And this one's a struggle. People struggle with this a lot. They struggle with their relationship with God. You see, condemnation is not a result of being good or bad. See, we want condemnation, that, that condemnation has to be tied to being good or bad. That when I'm good, there should be no reason to condemn me. And when I'm bad, I probably can condemn myself enough. Right? And there's this idea that, that, that like, I should be able to press into to God and be good enough. Asking for a vote here again, asking for your hands. How many of you on your best days of worshiping God, like if you could pick a period in your life and say, I was closest to God during these moments, still really screwed the whole thing up? Okay, all right. Now, how many of you on your worst days, when you say, these are the days I wish I could forget, still realize that God was there with you? Really, just about the same amount of people. Because the, the point is, is that you and I cannot, I'm just telling you, 20 years of giving my life to Christ, gave my life to Christ when I was 17. Oh, 22 years. I'm going to be 40 this year. I'm not going to be able to teach in here anymore. But when I gave my life to Christ, like 22 years ago, man, there were things that I thought I wouldn't struggle with years later. Like, I thought I'd get different things under wrap, and you'd go, okay, that'll be go away, that'll go away, that'll go away. And then you wake up 22 years later, and you go, oh, yeah, still struggling, still struggling with stuff. Because, because this is, this is, condemnation is not a result of being good or bad. If I was to pick a couple people out and set them up here on the stage, and I was to pick out, like, the best person in here, Mother Teresa, somebody like that, and I was to put them right here. And that was the person that you know that you don't even hang around with that person because this person is so good, they make you look bad all the time. And then over here was somebody else that has this really bad reputation that, as a matter of fact, they blow it all the time. And you go, that's the guy you want to stay away from. That's this guy right here. Neither one of these people have a better chance at a better relationship with God because of the way they are. Both of them only have a chance in a relationship with God because of who God is. That's it. Whoever believes in me is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. In 1665, the great plague went through Europe. 15% of London's population was wiped out in four months. That's amazing. 15% in four months, London's population. When they would see the signs of the bubonic plague on a person, their tongue would begin to swell. 
They would walk around with a fever. They would have dizzy spells. They would begin to hallucinate. When they would begin to see those signs, you know what they would do? Because the bluponic plague was disastrous. It wasn't something that you got and maybe lived through. If you got it during this time, you were certain to die. They would take you. They'd take your whole family. They'd put you in your house, and they'd nail the door shut, and they'd put a red cross on your door. The condemnation that was on them was certain death. You see, this is what Jesus, this is what God recognized upon you and I. That because sin had entered the world, that you and I were condemned not by God, but by sin. That you and I are condemned by the simple fact that we don't have the ability not to. You can't be good enough for God. You don't have the ability. I don't have the ability. I can't be bad enough to God. There's nothing that I do that he doesn't already know that I have the ability to do. Right? And there's nothing that I do that he goes, Whoa, jeez. I didn't know he was going to do that. (laughs) That must have really hurt. (laughs) Right? Romans 3.12 says that all have turned away. They have together become worthless. There was no one who is good, not even one. You see, here's the the transition point. You've got to catch this. Not only is condemnation not a result of being good or bad, but condemnation is just simply as a result of the fact that we sin. A lot of people including myself, have at times you feel so condemned for the way you live or the things you've done that you feel ashamed to come to Christ like like maybe the woman at the well who felt so shamed in her life and that she couldn't believe that not only did God know the things that she did, get this, She was blown away by the fact that God knew her lifestyle. Like he wouldn't. Right? Not only was she blown away by the fact that God knew her lifestyle, you know what even blew her away even more? God loved her. For who she was. God didn't love her if she changed. God loved her as she was. There is no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, here's the key. you got to get this. There is no shame in coming to Christ. There is no shame in coming to Christ. This isn't in my notes, but when my wife and I, we got pregnant in high school. I'm a church kid. Don't you think that there was a lot of shame in my house? There was a ton of shame in my house. Don't you think that there was a lot of shame in my life? There was a ton of shame in my life. But there was no shame in coming to Christ. When when, when I came before Christ and said, God, I need you, God didn't say, hey, get it cleaned up and we'll talk in the morning. He said, you thought I didn't know? Yeah, I thought you didn't know. Dude, I knew. He said, and I love you. That's that's what John is saying to Nicodemus. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light. That's human nature, because our deeds are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. Verse 21, pay attention. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his work have been carried out in God. You see, here's what happened for me. I came to Christ. All the things that I laid out and I thought he was going to expose, they were already exposed. And it was not until I came out 
and laid my heart and my life before Christ and asked for forgiveness that God could bring redemption to my life. That, that the result of the life that I get to live today is not because Paul Watson is good. It is because God has redeemed what the enemy tried to destroy in me. That the enemy is just that. He's Satan. He's the great enemy. He wants to take you out. He wants to ruin your life. He wants to bring destruction to your life. There is no condemnation for people who accept Christ and accept God's goodness. Condemnation only comes when you refuse to accept God's redeemingness, the re redemption. Does that make sense? Okay, here's the illustration. The illustration is this. If we all go to dinner tonight at your favorite restaurant, Texas Roadhouse, is that okay? We all go to Texas Roadhouse, I'm buying. All right? That changes everything, right? I'm buying. If we all go to the restaurant and there's 140 of us, there's 200 of us, whatever's in this room, and we all go to the restaurant and we order dinner, and I say, I'm buying, and we all eat dinner, and you come up to me at the end and say, hey, dude, I can't let you buy. No, 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 I'm buying. Like, we all participated. I'm buying. No, dude, I, I can't let you buy. And we walk out the door. I pay the check for everybody that wants to let me buy, which is everybody but you. And then you look around and go, oh, dude, I don't have my wallet. You're still responsible. You're still responsible. You had redemption. You, 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 you got to accept the free gift. The only way that you don't get the free gift is if you don't accept it. That's it. That's what it boils down to. Because God didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. And he is not a way. He is the way. Here's what we're going to do tonight. Here's how we're going to close. Tonight's communion Sunday. I'm going to ask the servers to go ahead and come forward. And I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And most of the time we do communion on the front side. But the whole reason we do com communion is one, one reason. That's to connect to God. You know, communion rep represents his body, which was broken on the cross, and his blood, which was spilt on the cross. That's what communion represents. And when you take communion, what you are saying in your act of receiving communion is, God, I can't do it. I need you. I need you. I accept your redemption. Here's what's really cool. You don't have to have ever come to Vineyard a day in your life to participate in communion. Because communion wasn't our idea. This was what God commanded us to do. It, it's not a religious ceremony. It's a spiritual practice. During this last song, maybe you love God with all your heart. And just once again, you're going to come down, you're going to take communion, you're going to take the elements back to your seat, and we'll take it all together. But maybe you have a great relationship with God, and you're just saying, you know what, God? I'm just saying thank you for everything you've done for me. There's nothing I could ever do to make it up to you. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you're a constant struggler. And, and then you're coming back, and you're saying, God, man, I need you all over again today just as much as I needed you yesterday and just as much as I'm going to need you tomorrow. Here's my stuff. Please and thank you for taking it. Maybe you've never really given your life to Christ. You come down and you say, you know what, God? I am accepting the free gift that you gave for God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him, that's all you gotta do, whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. This is the practice of accepting God's free gift of life. And you just take that back to your seat. We'll take communion together. I'll come up, I'll pray over us. We'll drink the juice, we'll eat the bread together, and we will give God glory. Amen?
we're not going to release you out of your seats because sometimes I think that sometimes it's good just to sit and contemplate what God did for you. Sometimes it's good to jump up and go get it. And whatever God's doing with you in your heart, let that be what's natural and let that be what's right. All right?
Let's honor God. I'm going to ask that you to stand with me. Now, Father, we're going to come before you right now, Lord God. Lord, we will never, we will never be able to say thank you enough. Lord, I, I, I know that we will never be able to do enough acts of kindness. We will never be able to do so many good works that, that we could ever make up for how lost and how far astray we go, God. Lord, this was the act of kindness. That God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him would not perish but they would have eternal life. Father, we come before you right now, and we thank you that as we recognize who you are and what you've done on our behalf that what we could never do, that God, we recognize that you hung on a cross, that you paid the price that was meant for us the price that we could never pay, God. And so, Father, at this moment, we say thank you, and we recognize this bread as your body that hung on a cross for the sins that we've committed. And so we now take that bread, and we say thank you. Lord, the second part of this covenant, the second part of this, um, this relationship with you is it wasn't just that you took the place for us, God, but Lord, that your sin and only your, uh, that your blood and only your blood had the ability to cover our sin, God. The Lord, that you paid the price and that three days later that you were raised from the dead, breaking the, the bounds of sin, breaking the the bounds of death, God. And Lord, we recognize that it was your blood that covers our sin. And we take this blood and we say thank you. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. All church said, amen. God bless you guys. If you would like prayer, we would love to, we would, we're going to be sticking around here a little while. We have a, a whole small group that shows up just for this service. I just broke my glass. I am strong. <laughs> that uh, shows up at this service just to pray with people. I believe we are going to do one more um, worship song. So if you want to stick around and worship with one more song, great. But otherwise, God bless you and have a great night.
Have a great night.